Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tank. My name is Alan. Ever since we found out that Din Djarin was a part of the Children of the Watch, we made the assumption that this was a subgroup that branched off from the Death Watch. What's our proof? Well, the blue armor-wearing Mandalorians that saved Din Djarin had Death Watch sickles on their armor, and then Paz Vizsla is clearly a member of this group as well, and the Vizslas more or less always seem to end up in Death Watch throughout the course of Star Wars history. Speaking of history, I thought today would be a great time to sit down and take a look at the entire history of the Death Watch, and basically their influence on the galaxy and Mandalorian culture. You can't really have Death Watch without the Vizsla family. So we're gonna start off this video by looking at one of the first and most important Vizslas, Tar Vizsla. Why was he important? Well, he was the first Mandalorian to be accepted within the Jedi Order. This would have been a pretty big deal at the time because the Jedi and Mandalorians were sworn enemies. They were very much ideologically opposed. One side embraced warfare as the sole meaning of life. The other side rejected warfare and tried to avoid violence as much as possible. Now, during his time in the Jedi, Tar Vizsla would forge the Darksaber, a very unique black-bladed weapon that looked unlike any other lightsaber available. Tar Vizsla would reach the rank of Jedi Knight, and then he would return to Mandalore and become the Mandalore, the leader of the Mandalorian people. Tar Vizsla would be remembered as a good and wise leader. His Darksaber would become a symbol of leadership for all Mandalorians and for the Vizsla clan. Tar Vizsla's reign would increase the legitimacy and power of the Vizsla clan, something that would stay with the Mandalorians for many generations. So how does Death Watch start? Well, let's just take a look at this quote from Kaus Karata, one of the most objectively Mandalorian Mandalorians who has ever Mandalored on Mandalore. Here's what he says about the group. They dress themselves up as patriots wanting to return to the good old days of the Mando Empire, but it was just the cover for organized crime. So yeah, that's basically how they started as an organization, Death Watch, preyed on the nostalgia that a lot of Mandalorians had for their glorious past. Which makes no sense because the Mandalorians had reached their pinnacle almost 4,000 years prior to the creation of Death Watch, and since then they've been on a pretty drastic decline. By 60 BBY, no Mandalorian was actually alive during the Mandalorian Imperial times when they held massive amounts of territory and had massive armies. Death Watch also always failed to mention that it was aggressive expansion and Sith influence that created the Mandalorian Empire, an empire that was ultimately unsustainable and forced the galaxy to unite against the Mandalorians, which led to the Mandalorians' defeat. Facing such a long and terrible decline is pretty hard, especially for such a proud and powerful people. Even if none of them were alive for the glorious times of the Mandalorian Empire, there are plenty of legends and stories to kind of excite their imagination. By 60 BBY, the Mandalorians were more or less scattered across the galaxy. Large groups of Mandalorian warriors basically lived like nomadic mercenaries, drifting from one world to another, seeking new clients to fight for. Around this time, a business deal for a distillery goes sour and explodes into a full-on Mandalorian invasion of the world Ithul. The Mandalorians quickly overcame the planet's orbital stations and then went on to crash several of their cloud cities into the ground, resulting in the near extinction of the Ithulan race. Now, clearly, the Mandalorians overacted a little bit here. I mean, this was just a small dispute over a distillery. But to be honest, the Mandalorians had probably lost their way some time ago. As happened in the past, the wider galaxy would respond to this genocide and a group of rogue Jedi Knights and a Jedi bounty hunter known as Dirge were sent to assassinate the ruling Mandalore at the time. A lot of Mandalorians were also turned off by this really kind of over the top and out of control and violent behavior from their peers. And so finally, a very charismatic Mandalorian by the name of Yaser Muriel would become Mandalore of his people and he would create the Super Commando Codex a new standard for Mandalorian ethics. This wasn't just a simple moral guide or ethics code, though. It was actually deeply rooted in the Resolnair, which were the central tenets of Mandalorian ancient culture. The Super Commando Codex would also standardize the behavior of Mandalorian mercenaries and bounty hunters, making them more appealing to clients. 
The whole purpose behind Yay Samuriel's movement, which was called the True Mandalorians, was turning Mandalorians from shameful professions like being raiders and brigands, instead making them operate like the highly paid elite soldiers that they were. Now, there are two other major factions in Mandalorian culture at the time. You had the new Mandalorians who were complete pacifists. Even though Yaser and Muriel's attempt to reform were genuine, they didn't go far enough for this very progressive faction. Then you had Death Watch, led by Tor Vizsla. This was a group of violent radicals who were opposed to Yaser Muriel and his Super Commando Codex. Like Hal Skirata said, these individuals didn't really understand what it meant to be a Mandalorian. Their view of the Mandalorian's past highlighted periods of time when the Mandalorians were directly being manipulated by Sith. In short, they were all about being chaotic, lacking self-control, and they pursued power above all else. Tor Vizsla, their leader, was neither an honorable or a really good fighter. Yet his message was appealing to those who had grievances with Mandalorian society, or Perhaps they were just murderers and criminals who didn't like personal restraints that the Super Commando Codex was putting on them. Now, Tor Vizsla's ultimate goal was supposedly to start a new crusade against the galaxy and reclaim uh, the past glory of Mandalore's empire. But of course, most of his time was spent fighting against the true Mandalorians and sabotaging their work. During one battle on the agricultural world of Concord Dawn, Death Watch ambushed the true Mandalorians and also orphaned a young boy named Jango Fett. Jango Fett would become almost a son-like figure and protege for Yester Muriel. Now, Tor Vizsla would ambush the True Mandalorians again on Corda 6, and Tor managed to kill Yester Muriel, pushing the young Jango Fett into a command position. Death Watch would continue to meddle with the True Mandalorians and eventually led them to another trap that pitted the Jedi against Jango Fett and his crew. This horrible event would be known as the Battle of Galadron, and several Jedi and the rest of Jango Fett's true Mandalorians would perish during it. Jedi Master Dooku was actually in charge of this operation, and the bloodshed was so great and pointless that this battle was considered a turning point for Dooku as a Jedi. Fett would spend years in captivity as a slave, but finally would escape and would track down Tor Vizsla and kill him once and for all. This would destroy Death Watch as an organization, but the ideas that Tor Vizsla championed would still remain in Mandalorian society, albeit secretly because the majority of Mandalorian society really did not like Death Watch at all and what it stood for. In canon, the main focal point of Mandalorian history would be the Mandalorian Civil War fought between Death Watch and the New Mandalorians. The New Mandalorians would win this conflict, and Death Watch was thought to have died out on the moon of Concordia. But what had actually happened was Death Watch just faded back into society. They hid their beliefs because they were afraid of losing their jobs or being canceled or whatever. Which is why cancel culture is kind of dumb. You want radicals to display their beliefs in public forums where they can be challenged. It's probably a better solution. But instead, Death Watch would continue to grow underground. They would continue to build their power and influence on Mandalore until they were ready to make a move against the current government. A government that was completely unprepared and believed that they were extinct up till that point. In the midst of the Clone Wars, Death Watch would strike first under the leadership of Pre Vizsla with terrorist attacks in Sundari, the capital of Mandalore. The new Mandalorians were at the head of a coalition of neutral systems and fighting hard against influence from both the Separatists and Republic. Now, the Death Watch attack was pretty opportunist and caught the new Mandalorians at a really bad time. But Death Watch numbers were never really large. They were always a small group of individuals since inception, and when they were discovered by the New Mandalorians, they had to flee into exile. Now, Pre Vizsla and Death Watch would find refuge on the remote world of Karlak. It was during this time that the relatively disciplined paramilitary organization turned into little more than a group of heavily armed bandits and raiders. Pre Vizsla was running out of options and manpower. Creating an alliance with the Confederacy of Independent Systems had been a dead end. Count Dooku was not to be trusted. But then on a routine patrol, Death Watch recovered an escape pod that was occupied by two powerful force-wielding Death Miri Zabrox, Maul and his brother Savage Opress. These fearsome warriors were exactly what Death Watch needed. Pre Vizsla and Maul, with their shared hatred of Obi-Wan Kenobi, decided to join in a very unholy alliance. The next step in their operation was to build an army. Death Watch would turn towards criminal syndicates like the Huts the Pikes and the Black Sun, 
Using the Death Mary Brothers as muscle, Death Watch was able to quickly assemble one of the largest criminal organizations the galaxy had ever seen. They called it the Shadow Collective. Once again, we see Death Watch is willing to do anything for power. There's nothing traditional about joining forces with criminal scum and then using those criminal scum to launch an attack against your own home planet, the Mandalore. You see, that was the exact plan that pre Vizsla wanted to use, have all these scary aliens attack Sundari City, and then Death Watch would just kind of swoop in and rescue Mandalore from those silly new Mandalorian pacifists. And this plan works out really well, and the new Mandalorians are kicked out of power. pre Vizsla then turns on Maul and his brother, which was kind of a bad move, because when Maul escapes, he challenges his former ally to an honor duel with lightsabers. Maul, who was a trained Sith assassin, easily took out pre Vizsla, and all of a sudden, he became the legitimate ruler of Mandalore. Bo-Katan Kryze, who headed the Night Owls faction of the Death Watch, would leave the group claiming that Maul was an outsider and did not really understand the ways of the Mandalorians. Maul would only rule for a short time, but pre Vizsla losing the crown to Maul would basically end Death Watch as we know it. Some like the Night Owls would leave Mandalore, some would continue to serve under Maul and would be defeated when the Republic came and retook the world with Bo-Katan and her Night Owls. Another splinter group seemed to have intervened in a separatist attack on an unknown world and saved the individual who would one day become Din Djarin. It's possible also that one element of Death Watch would create the group known as the Children of the Watch, which would still exist by 9 ABY. But for the most part, Death Watch's legacy amongst Mandalorians is quite negative. The protectors of Concord Dawn saw them as traitors, a very common viewpoint. As annoying as new Mandalorians were, they had a vision for their world and truly wanted to improve the livelihoods of their people. Their incompetent execution of that plan was what doomed them. But it didn't necessarily justify the Death Watch's grab for power because once they were in power, they weakened several institutions that were designed to protect the planet and eventually they kind of opened the doors for Imperial occupation. Had there not been so much instability caused by Death Watch, Duchess Satine's government would still be in control of Mandalore and the Siege of Mandalore would have never happened in the first place. Now, all eyes in Star Wars fandom now rest on the children of the Watch, this new group which might be the progeny of the original Death Watch movement. Is it possible for former members of Death Watch to redeem themselves? Bo-Katan Kryze definitely did, and it'll be interesting to see what happens to Din Djarin as we learn more about the faction he belongs to. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.